Dominic. Thank you uh, very much for letting me share my favorite tools. I found uh, I'm an internist cardiologist in Boston, and I've um, been in practice over 30 years. And it's great to come to meetings, learn things, apply them, give them to your patients, see the benefits, and then come here and share that with you. So I hope to do that today. I designed the slides to, so that you can read them and understand it, but I, don't, I think these four tools are so important. First of all is vitamin D. Vitamin D, I was always taught, not only for bones, but to try to get the value between around 40, because it reduces the risk of prostate cancer and breast cancer. So I routinely would check my patients' vitamin D levels, and most routinely they're always low, and I would give them oral vitamin D3. Now I understand that the value, the blood value should be up to 60. But when I give my patients vitamin D according to what I'm gonna tell you today, they get normal restorative sleep, they begin to sleep better, they begin to be, be repaired uh, at night, and we'll talk about that. The normal intestinal bacteria that make the B vitamins come back again, so it, it corrects dysbiosis, and at some point you need to give extra vitamin B. So with those kind of summary comments, let me see if I can explain. The vitamin D receptors, we have them all over our body. Uh, most of them are unappreciated in the uh, anterior and posterior hypothalamus, the pituitary, the substantia nigra. It's really not a vitamin, it's a, it's a hormone. It's a steroid hormone that knocks, knocks on the door of receptors and most of us have our receptors that are not being signaled. We, the, the Quest Lab in Boston that I use is the normal range for vitamin D is 30 to 100. I thought it should be 40, it should be 60 to 80. And it's individual, it's not the dose. The dose for someone to take 5,000 units, they, they get a level of 40, someone else goes up to 80. You need to check the patient's own blood level as you give someone vitamin D. This data has been come from Dr. Stasha Gominak, and I've learned this in the last year, and it's just unbelievable information, the benefit of having an adequate vitamin D level of 60 to 80 nanograms. Healthy sleep requires an ideal vitamin D level and a healthy microbiome. So when someone has a low level of vitamin D, the bacteria in the intestine that normally makes the B vitamins aren't there. So when you have someone having low vitamin D, they're also deficient in vitamin B. So as you begin replacing them, you have to give them vitamin B all together in a pill, not just one at a time. I'm just parroting that what she's learned after treating about 5,000 patients this way. Nightly repair, and we'll talk about that in a bit, begins to occur. And the healthy bacteria recur, return, and, it, and actually, Vitamin D is a growth factor that controls the presence of healthy bacteria. We all want to avoid dysbiosis, and one way to do that is to normalize your vitamin D. There are eight B vitamins, and they're pivotal for sleep, and they're all made by our own bacteria. She has found, Dr. Gomenak, that as you replace someone with vitamin D to the normal levels, it takes about three months. You just can't just put them on large doses. You have to give them the B50, you have to give them B vitamins at the same time. Once they've reached a certain level, the body then is permitted to uh, proceed to nightly repair. You know, I never knew that, but I didn't realize that there are two phases of deep sleep, REM sleep and slow wave sleep. During that time, when we phase into that while we sleep, we become paralyzed. We become physically paralyzed, we cannot move. And the purpose of that normal phenomena is so that we can heal. If you don't get a vitamin D level up to 60 to 80, you don't have an opportunity to heal. What a deal. You give someone vitamin D, you restore their sleep, you give them the permission to heal, and you restore their bacteria. These are the areas in the brain that, where the vitamin D receptors are. And when you get paralyzed, the different areas work. And it, during one phase, you have one part, and another phase, you have another part. We all know the the different vitamins, thiamine, B1, B2, B3, B5, pyridoxine. But we know that the, there's some more active forms of pyridoxine, pyridoxine 5-phosphate, methylated folic acid instead of cyanocobalamin. I doubt if the body, the bacteria, make the active form of B6. And when Dr. Gominak gives patients this generic B50, which is made by multiple vitamin companies, one or two pills a day, as you replace the vitamin D, patients get better. They be, their dysbiosis goes away, their sleep gets better. It's simply amazing. 
So what we have is the healthy intestinal uh, microbiome produces all eight B vitamins. Of the eight, um, the one that's most important, especially later, is B5. And sometimes, once you get healed, you need to add back B5. We're talking about that in a second. There's a dilemma, is when you have a patient who's sick and they're vitamin D deficient and they're achy, they're, if you give them back the B vitamins and give them vitamin D, they start getting better. Once you get them back to normal, the level back up, then the bacteria that has not been making B vitamins starts making them, and you have to stop the B. So now you have a person who's got a normal vitamin D, you've stopped the B vitamins that you've been supplementing because now they're making them and they do well. A few months go by and all of a sudden that body has determined, now it's time to, to, to make the deferred repairs and they need more B vitamins and they get sick again. They get achy and they have a normal vitamin D level. You had, have to add back the vitamin D and then you have to start titrating up B5. So it's complex. You have to w watch your patients clinically. But when you do this, they restore their sleep and they start healing themselves. Phase one, we have a patient who's got vitamin D deficiency. You give them vitamin D, you determine their vitamin D level, and every month you check it as you titrate up the dose and you give them vitamin B complex. The second phase is when now they're B repleted, you've stopped the vitamin B, they feel good, they're sleeping well. The third phase, and then all of a sudden, They've been doing well, now they're back getting achy again, and that's when they need more bees to take care of the healing that's being done at night. You have to ask your patients and test your patients, and when you do that, they progressively get better. Now, I've been doing this for about eight months, and it is amazing to see. I don't know how many patients I see can't get to sleep, or if they get to sleep, they wake up, and it all goes away. If you go to Dr. Uh, Gomenak's website, she has all this data that explains this much more eloquently than I did. So I encourage you to go to our website. Now, scars and neurotherapy. I've been in um, Germany and Switzerland sometimes, and, and almost all physicians inject scars, and I thought I'd just go through this with you. It's really easy, and the patients benefit, and it's a skill that's cheap. So neurotherapy is the injection of local anesthetics, such as procaine, not lidocaine, into scars, which we're going to talk about, but there's also trigger points, acupuncture points, tendons, ligament insertions, but we're just going to talk about scars because it's simple. The autonomic nervous system controls so much, we've talked about it all, so much in this conference. Um, when someone has any type of trauma and, the dam and damages the autonomic nervous system, ce cell membranes can't repolarize. And there's an injury, whenever there's an injury and you have a scar, that's what happens. The membranes can't repolarize and they, become, they begin having interference fields that block the effectiveness of the body's communication across the, bo the body's network. How does it work? When you inject scars into patients, illness is, parts of the body downstream become, he, become healed, well away from where the scar is. Someone has low back pain and you inject their appendectomy scar and the back pain goes away. Someone has knee pain and in Switzerland they inject your tons where your tonsils were taken out and the knee pain goes away. So all this distance from away by, it's because you're blocking the theories interfering fields and there are four theories and I put them here and you can read them at your leisure, but the most common one is probably is the first one, is the accumulation of waste products. But there's a nervous system theory, the fascia is involved, uh, and then the grounds to the matrix theory, the lymphatic theory. So interference fields, these are uh, blockages due to, to healing that are act either independently or part of a constellation of a lot of insults. There's a dysautonomia within the location, and when you inject the procaine into the scar, it somehow reduces that, repolarizes the system, and this is best seen in this. In many patients, this doesn't happen. That stays in maintained depolarization, and you come in with procaine, and you can restore that. And instantly, and then uh, sometimes dramatically, they, they get better, but many times you need five or six injections. So routinely in Europe, they, they inject scars five or six times. What's the most, we all have one scar, uh, umbilicus. And, and the next one is the most is our tonsils out. And so it's kind of, and, and, it's, and these are important things to, when you see a patient, to consider it. And here's how we can uh, kind of graphically see how it works. So this is intramuscular, subcutaneous, intradermal, but what we really want is intracutaneous. So the, the strategies are this. You identify the scar, you prep the, plate, the scar with alcohol, you outline the scar with a pen, you let it dry, you select the right gauge needle, 
you put it into the scar and you, as, you, as you put it through the scar, as you then get to the end of the scar and as you pull out, you inject the procaine. There's somebody injecting a scar and sometimes you have to bend it. Over here on the left, you have to bend the needle so it can get into the scar and over here you inject it through and, it, and then you see it blow up and that results in some clinical response instantly or you bring them back every couple of weeks and do this. It's amazing, cheap, easy thing to do. The next one is the mouth. We're all taught to take a history review assistant and examine the patient from the top down. I never examine the mouth. The mouth is the source of so many illnesses. And I think it's so important, and I've learned that to take a history and to do this. So is there some source of inflammation in someone who is sick? Taking a dental history, they, do they have a history of root canals, braces, wisdom teeth, Dental surgery, dental infection, dis, uh, trouble swallowing, are they a mouth breather, a nose, nas nose breather, is mercury present, do they have crowns that have been put over an unhealthy tooth, do they have pain, do they have the wrong bite, do they have TMJ pain, do they have tooth infections, do they, does it, do they have a sinus pain, it, and do they can't sleep, and do they have Tourette syndrome, and other movement disorders. You examine them, you look with a light, you look around inside, you look for missing teeth, inflammation, you look at the gums, it takes seconds and you find so many sources of inflammation uh, that begins to explain why they might be ill. There are four possible areas of obstruction, the, in the two in the nose and, two, and one behind the tongue and then one in the pharynx. And it's so important for obstructive sleep apnea to determine where your patient, if they have obstruction, is it the nasal area or the pharyngeal area? And we know the symptoms are heavy uh, snoring, they stop breathing, uh, your spouse tells you that you, you have a problem, high blood pressure, more daytime sleepiness, it's so common. And this is a retruded tongue, it's blocking off the airway. It is very common to have a frenulum that's tight. Here, this is under the tongue. When the tongue is not allowed to go to the top of the mouth, you end up having a narrow high arch palate and there's mercury and there's a high arch palate. And what happens when this happens is the jaw goes posterior when you, when you sleep and also during the day. That causes stress on the trigeminal nerve and goes into the brainstem. It can cause illnesses, Tourette syndrome, OCD. There's the mercury, there's grinding. And when patients have this posterior jaw deviation that occurs as they grow, their head goes forward. And when they go forward, they, they, they start becoming a, a mouth breather. They start then putting stress on this brainstem right there. So the temporal mandibular joint, when it's being pressed by the, temp by the jaw that's backward, caused Tourette syndrome. Now I went to Baltimore to a conference a couple of months ago, and they showed videos of a 10-year-old boy who was, had uh, Tourette syndrome since the age of five. And he went to this clinic and they put a mouthpiece on him and he instantly recovered, functionally recovered. A 61-year-old man had Tourette's syndrome since the age of 16. They put the mouthpiece in to move the jaw forward, took the pressure off the brainstem, and the illness stopped. It's absolutely unbelievable. It's hidden from view unless you, unless you look for it. The teeth are linked to our bodies, and I have a patient who I, I'm a, I run a hyperbaric chamber and she was coming in to get uh, her uh, sores in her mouth uh, helped by hyperbaric oxygen and she had lung cancer. And she's a healthy woman, nine-year-old boy, seven-year-old boy, 48 years old, and was healthy. I said, why? And you have, she said, well, I had a terrible root canal five years ago. I said, find out where that, and I looked in, I couldn't see anything. I said, looked in, and so, tooth 18. When we did, I sent her to a biological dentist, she has an abscess and it the root canal. Well, tooth 18 is lung, left lung. Now, does that mean that that chronic inflammation, it's certainly been chronic, and that lung contributed to her lung cancer? I don't know, but that should be taken out. That should be taken out. And we need to look and fix and prevent. Good, I have plenty of time to talk about what's changed my life and my practice. The electro echoscope. I've been using this piece of equipment for the past three and a half years. As an internist cardiologist, a patient would come in my office and they would have a sore shoulder. 
a bad knee, a trigger finger, a bad back, and I would give them some safe analgesic, an anti-inflammatory like turmeric or Boswellia, I would try to avoid the NSAIDs, and I would send them to a neurologist, a back surgeon, an orthopedic doctor. Now I don't send them to anybody. I, when they, they, I send them to them, but now I fix, I can help them so much. And my staff, I have a trained nurse who does this. So this is the machine, electroecroscope. Every living creature is electrical in nature. It's just like Dr. Tennant said, the key thing is to put voltage into the body to increase ATP. Unhealthy cells don't have the same resonating frequency. Restoring electrical homeostasis. If a low energy cell is able to be charged up to normal, the cell can begin to heal. It's so true, it is so true. An imbalanced autonomic nervous system is a feature of many, many chronic illnesses. This device instantly corrects it. You know, um, when you put, when you see a patient who has chronic inflammation, and it just sits there, and you put the probes across the joint, you can see it begin the swelling to go down right away with, before they leave the office. 60% of the pain is improved because what we've instantly done is begin to allow the body to heal from the inside out. The, the brain recognizes this signal. It's a micro voltage. I, apoptosis is a, health, is a healthy process. The cell begins to say, I'm dying, and the, it coalesces. When it's necrotic and it, 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 it ruptures, your immune system sees it and begins causing autoimmune disease. So you want to have cells die healthy, but you also want to be able to keep the cells from becoming necrotic and exploding. And restoring energy to the cells accomplishes that purpose. So we have an EEG, we have EMG, EKG. We shock people to bring them back. We should be treated electrically. And we should use a machine that has this capability to do that. Historically, I'm going to swing through this in, in the Baghdad batteries, they made an electrical device. They used to, people used to step on fish that put electrical imp impulses to help them heal in the, in the early days. These are the, um, the articles that document the efficacy of this product. A TENS unit tricks the body into not knowing the pain is going to the brain. It doesn't cause healing. That's macro voltage. Uh, this is C-fiber, goes up to the brain, and if you in, in put a signal here and make it a beta fiber, they don't feel the pain as much. It doesn't correct the problem. It helps reduce the pain. This is the study, chronic back pain in 1983, performed by the person who invented this machine. And they treated 40 patients with chronic back pain. They treated them with microcurrent simulation, placebo versus the simulation. And the patients, 37% of patients got the pain relieved. The others didn't. And later, they were much improved. I see this every day. I treat the lower back and the pain markedly improves. And three treatments moves them along the path of health. The conclusion was that what, what now we know, it enhances membrane potential, it enhances ATP production, it reduces inflammation. They've got the Nobel Prize for realizing that voltage-sensitive ion channels exist and our own bodies use the same frequency to open these. There are these voltage ion channels and they, when, when there's a normal gradient across that, uh, that channel, Good stuff goes in and bad stuff comes out. When they're blocked, the patient has pain. And so when we actually put the signal back to the body, these voltage channels open up and become healing and, and begin re dumping their toxins and receiving the, the vital healthy products they have not been able to get in. In summary, it searches and discovers abnormalities in the body's electrical system. The patient guides you. When a person comes in, they have pain, you find out where the pain is and see if the body can hold charge. You put the probes on the body and it can hold charge. So you dial it up until they hold charge and you then go through different frequencies. And at each frequency, they hold charge. And when you stop, for that period of time, those cells have opened. And it's almost like an entrainment. As you give patients repeated doses of the, of the voltages that are designed by the protocols, the, the cell begins to recover. It infuses charge to the channels. It allows waste removal to leave. The body normally has an impedance that stops the body from uh, opening up these channels. When you use this piece of equipment, it rapidly changes and allows the system to, reba to rebalance. So it's a new tool. It's a tool when, they, when acute injury occurs it, uh, and affects different sites within the body. The current medical approach is we isolate it, we put ice on it, we give them anti-inflammatories, and we send them home. 
When someone gets an acute injury, I get them to my office, I instantly put them on the machine, treat them for 30 minutes, bring them back the next day, the swelling goes away, and you, and you prevent the secondary inflammation where you can't heal. It allows it to heal from the inside out. It's a new mechanism of disease. It's allowed me to become a more integrative doctor. These are the tools behind it. This is the, um, the key probes. There are protocols. These are the ones I took to use. And, the, and they're, they're, so there's this, the basic protocols, plus then we give them a systemic protocol. And let me see if I can show you. The, and then different frequencies. You start at 0.5 frequency, and that has a wide band length, and then you clear. Then you move to 2.5 megahertz, 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, and 40. And, the, and the, narrow, the, the, the beam that you're putting in gets more and more narrow, and that progressively entrains the body to hold the charge. Here's a, a wide pro right probe on the back. This is a lymph drainage. You can it, it bring up the lymph up the leg, up to the groin. This is guided meditation. You put the paper in the right type of meditation using alpha waves, when you, right on the head to get them comfortable. These are the frequencies. Uh, hands and feet this is systemic. And the teeth. Um, just as the teeth were important in the other slide, so too here. There's a probe where you go through every tooth to find out there's inflammation if it holds its charge. When I took training in California, there was a um, person in my group, a woman, and we did this probe on her 14th tooth, severe pain, severe pain. And she said, I had just had breast surgery. I mean, the connection between the tooth and the organs are amazing. Again, that's why thinking about it, looking at these things, it really kind of opens your mind. And it was a left breast and the left side, sort of like my lady with the left lung. All right, then in addition to that, we have reflexology. So if someone has a sinus problem, if you stimulate the sinus, it helps so that the technology can be not only used in the local areas, but in the teeth, for reflexology, for the palms, in the ears. If you want to treat the knee, you put a printing into the ear where the knee is. So the body is, you can do this integrative treatment in, by using various methods to treat the same different organs with different techniques at the feet, the ear, or locally. One of my patients was a, is an artist, and this is, this is kind of what happens in the office. Someone comes in with shoulder pain, and I give them a 30 treatment, and they walk out. They have pain here in the back, they get better. The foot plantar fasciitis, carpal tunnel syndrome, trigger fingers. I have trigger fingers. I put it over the area, and it melts away, and the trigger finger goes away. This is knees. This is a fellow um, who came with rheumatoid arthritis, and he had bunion surgery at age 16 and developed acute rheumatoid arthritis. When I saw him years later, he had no flexion of his toe. I looked, the toe wasn't even flexing. And when I started treating him, it came back to normal and he could, started walking better. And I said the body kept it dampened that whole time and it freed it up. It's, it's really, it's amazing. Okay, and this is a case study. Say, well, is this, uh, is it just old people? Uh, <laughs> I had an 18 year old um, basketball star in Boston and her mother was my IV infusionist, and she was uh, in the semifinals for the state, and she came down and sprained her ankle on a Tuesday afternoon. She came from there to my office, and her, knee, her ankle was severely swollen. She could barely walk. We gave her a treatment Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and she went to, and all the swelling got better. She was still, absolutely not perfect, but all the swelling, the pain went away. She went and played in the finals and they won the championship. But why does the body, without this treatment, she would have been in bed, for, had been off her feet for a 10 days, two weeks. And this thing instantly recovered. I've learned that the sooner you get the, the micro voltage into the organ, the patients instantly recover. I mean, instantly improve. It's just amazing. I had a patient who, uh, a 54-year-old fellow who was playing basketball, and it was a Friday night, Friday afternoon, he came in my office, terribly swollen knee, he came down. I treated him Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. He, he got an MRI on Monday and saw the orthopedic doctor. He had a torn cartilage and a torn ligament, and there was no swelling. Eventually, he never had surgery. So the faster you can interfere with the body's inappropriate response to acute injury by using microvoltage therapy, has much as great advantages.
But to summarize, the key tools that I tried to tell you is vitamin D, it's important. If you get your level up and you give B vitamins going up, watch them and maybe add in more B vitamins. You can help so many things and you can allow their body to begin to heal themselves at night, nightly repair. Uh, scars, find a scar, use procaine, inject in the scar and neutralize the interfering fields. And you, can, and you should do five or six. And when you find one that has a dramatic change, you'll be impressed. But certainly long term, you get the same benefit. The mouth, examine the mouth. Look at the mouth, think of the mouth. TMJ, Tourette syndrome, movement disorders. They, they, they're, they're heads forward. They're, they're a mouth breather instead of a nose breather. They have mercury. They have teeth that have root canals that are sick and inflamed. You need to discover this. So I work with a biological dentist and I recommend, you know, try to uh, do just that. The electroecroscope, it's a unique machine that non-invasive allows me to take care of any inflammation and improve the patient and bring them back on a regular basis. And I tried to put different references and articles that kind of support, so you can learn this uh, in a more you know, informative way. In summary, I think I've tried to give you four tools, vitamin D, the scars, the mouth, and also the use of this a piece of equipment that, that allows you to stop inflammation and restore function to the body.